How are you guys doing? Good? Yeah. Good? Yeah? Awesome. If you guys have your Bibles, if you would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll be starting in verse 1. <clears throat> For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual morality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone, think, and let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Let's pray. i got to ask as I bring um, your message here this, this evening that you would give me clarity of thought, um, that I would be able to speak accurately and truthfully what your word says, and that uh, we would have open hearts to receive it um, as we are examined by you, Lord, to see where our hearts are at and to see how we stand with you, Lord, in our walk, that we would be willing to, to have you look to us, Lord, and help us uh, through this time. And I pray this in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Nathaniel, for <clears throat> was it last week, went through 1 Corinthians 9, and he started to talk at the end of his sermon about running the race that is before us. And in uh, uh, chapter 9, verses 24, it says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it? Every athlete exercises self-control and all these things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And I really wanted to bring that up because uh, chapter 10 really starts off with trying to give us a warning about the pitfalls and dangers as we run this race. And Paul makes another mention to this. If you go to the book of Philippians in 3.14, he says, I press on toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, the sense that he is on his way. He's pursuing Christ with his whole heart. That's the, the, the goal of his life is to run. That's the race that is set before him, and he has to run with endurance. And so Nathaniel talked a lot about self-control and self-discipline in our walk. And Paul is going to bring up to the Corinthians a warning, though, against idolatry, idolatry that can inhibit us or keep us from running the race. And it is a really real threat that we have to be willing to look at. <clears throat> um, before we get into the passage, I do want to kind of maybe give a little bit of a definition of what idolatry is. It can be a very archaic word. It's kind of like, what is what does that mean? What do you mean by idolatry? You're talking about wood, idols, and stones. And so I'm just going to put this definition. Now, this, this definition isn't something I just pull out of my hat. It's something I feel like is implicitly stated in this passage and in the Bible. And so I want you to test it, discern yourself if it is true or right. And we're going to talk about it and uh, open it up more as we go. But um, usually idolatry, when I talk to people about it, is the idea that it's the act or disposition of the heart that prefers, loves, worships, and adores anything or anyone more than Jesus Christ. And I think this is, this is a fair enough description, but I think I want to take it a step further because, I mean, there's, there is a sense that we can't, you know, do sin in moderation, right? Um, for instance, you know, if, I, if you love your spouse, right, that's good. But if you love your spouse more than God, then that's idolatry. But it's not like you can love God 
and then sort of have adultery on a lower level. And so I think a better description would be that idolatry is the act and disposition that prefers, loves, worships, and adores anything or anyone that is contrary to the character and nature of God. And so I want you to hold on to that because we're going to get into that more as we go through the passage. But Paul lays out the example of the Israelites um, after having left Egypt. God delivered them from Egypt, and God chose Moses to lead his people through the wilderness to the promised land. And so Paul is going to use them as an example. He says, I do not want you to be unaware, meaning he doesn't want us to be unaware of the pitfalls and the danger of idolatry. And so he's going to give us some characteristics or things we're going to find in this passage are characteristics or warnings against idolatry. And the first one is that idolatry is preceded by overconfidence in ourselves. Say that again. Idolatry is preceded by overconfidence in ourselves. In verses 1 through 5, Paul lays out the privileges, the blessings, and the spiritual experiences that the Israelites had while going through the wilderness. He talks about the fact that they passed through the sea and that they were guided by the cloud, meaning referring to the Red Sea, that God had parted the Red Sea that they can go through it, and that God led them by a pillar of cloud and pillar by night to lead them to the promised land. Um, Exodus 13 through 14 recounts this. Um, I'm not going to refer back to the passages just for the sake of time and such, so if you guys are interested in knowing all the Old Testament references, if you want to find me afterwards, uh, that would be great, and I'll, I'll reference it in the sermon, but I won't be able to read uh, through it all. But Paul gives the Corinthians a warning by example of the Israelites, and so he's making a comparison between them, okay? He's saying, here's where the Israelites were at, and I want you to, to take a look at yourself, examine yourself, allow God to examine yourself to see if you're in danger of falling. As he says in uh, verse two, 12, therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And so he's giving them a warning. He's, he's trying to show them the obstacles and hindrances for them running their race. So the first two privileges we see is the fact that they were crossed through the Red Sea and that they were guided by a pillar of cloud. And in this, Paul says that they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And when I first read that, I was very confused by what, what Paul was referring. Did he mean that he was literally baptized in like cloud and in the sea? Or what is, what is he necessarily referring to? And um, if you know, Paul is using baptism in its principal meaning, the fact that it's a union or a dying to oneself to another. And so in this idea, it's this union with Moses. And so they, because God chose Moses, Moses was a foreshadowing of Christ in a way. And so just as we die to ourselves and raise up to live for Christ, that's kind of what Paul is referring to here. The fact that through these experiences, they were able to partake in these blessings because they were one with Moses. They were in union with Moses. And that's what he means by baptism. So they were able to have these spiritual experiences, these blessings, and these privileges because God chose Moses. They also were fed manna and quail in the wilderness. <clears throat> and they also were able to be supplied supernatural water from a rock, as he says, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. And once again, uh, there was this, this tradition or this belief, this legend, that this rock, if you remember from um, Exodus 17, when Moses struck the rock and the water came out, that this rock, in a way, followed them throughout the wilderness, just like a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire. Um, and it's not that Paul necessarily is saying that this is the case, but he is using it as a metaphor to show that Christ was always there, that Christ was their spiritual nourishment, and that he was guiding them through the wilderness, that Christ was always there. And that also is very important because it shows that Christ is co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. It shows that Christ always existed and was always there. And it was also the fact that the Old Testament was pointing to Christ. Nonetheless, though, he says, despite these privileges, despite these experiences, despite these blessings, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. He says, now these things took place in exa as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. And so he goes then into a list of four sins that they commit and four accounts of what happened throughout the Israelite history um, as they were in the wilderness, things that brought them away from God and how they fell into idolatry. So he talks about the fact that they had the worship of the golden calf in Exodus 32, 6. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, and eventually that led into sexual morality. Or in Numbers 25, 1 through 9, they talk about the fact that they took up Moabite wives and began to worship the god Bel. And Bel is a god of fertility, so naturally, how do you worship a god of fertility? You partake in sexual immorality. In Numbers 21, 4 through 9, they tested God. It says that, And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? They were testing 
God. Eventually, fiery serpents came and killed many of them. There was grumbling, complaining. In Numbers 16, 41 through 50, the plague killed many due to their complaints and grumblings against God. And so Paul's trying to show a comparison here. The, the Israelites were baptized with Moses, and they experienced these, these blessings, these privileges as followers. And then the Corinthians are set up as being baptized in Christ, experiencing the privilege of the Lord's Supper and baptism and the blessings that God has given them. And he's making a comparison. He's saying, but nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. And he says, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for instruction to whom the end of ages has come. He says, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. I think what happened in this case was that the Israelites became overconfident in themselves because of the blessings, privileges, and spiritual experiences they had. And so they thought that these external outward signs of blessings or experiences, or even maybe their own actions, somehow meant that they were walking closely to God. And they became confident in themselves. And that's why Paul says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. And overconfidence leads to a carelessness. It can lead to a carelessness in our walk with God, because our foundation and our assurance or our confidence is in ourselves and what we have done or what we experience. Are we putting, for instance, our confidence in the fact that we grew up in a Christian home or that we go to church or that you'd send Catalyst every Thursday? Are you putting your confidence in your own works or in the fact that your mom and dad prayed for you every day? What is your confidence in? And I think it's important because what we put our confidence in, the object of our confidence is going to decide whether or not we fall or not. And so if we stand on our own belief that we're safe and we're okay based on what we can do, then we're going to fall. <clears throat> the worst thing you can do right now is to, is to say to yourself, well, uh, this doesn't apply to me, because it probably does. Because it's important to, to take, examine, allow God to examine your heart and be, where do I? Am I overconfident? As a warning sign of idolatry is an overconfidence in ourselves. Um, and why is overconfidence so dangerous? Well, I guess... The best way to explain how overconfidence leads to carelessness, I, I had a, a story or illustration that can maybe help, but last semester I took financial accounting, which was extremely, extremely difficult. And when you switch from theology to mathematics and business, it's one of the worst things ever. It's like you guys switching over to art class or something. <clears throat> and maybe you guys are really good at art, I don't know. But um, I was managing about a 96, not too bad, throughout... Uh, my classes and stuff, but it was, I wasn't understanding any of it. I'd, I'd go in and I'd be like, okay, I did that and I made it through, but what happened? And so at the end, they had the exam and the exam was a massive portion of the grade and I thought it was closed book and I had not really memorized any concepts and it was 35 chapters of anything and everything about business and financial accounting. And so I was really freaking out that whole, that whole week. I was, I was in over my head. And so I thought to myself, well, let me see what happens. If I fail this exam, will I still pass? And so I looked up and I did the math. I don't even know how I did it, but um, maybe you guys can explain it to me. But I found out that, oh, if I failed this, I will still pass the class. I will still get, you know, maybe a B minus or something, I thought to myself. So I don't study for the rest of the week. Why? Because I was pretty confident that I was, you know, even if I failed the exam, I was going to pass, and so everything was going to be okay. Well, <clears throat> I get to the exam, and thankfully, I came to my senses and said, I probably need to study a little bit, so I crammed for about two days. And thankfully, I did pass the exam, um, although I did make a major miscalculation, because if I would have failed that exam, I probably would have failed the class. And so my overconfidence led to a carelessness, but it was based on a false assurance, this false idea that for some reason because of all the work I had done previously in the class, I'll pass and it'll be okay. And I think that's the, that's the case when it comes to overconfidence in our spiritual walk with God. We can mistake outward appearances for inward truths. In other words, the Israelites were kind of falling into the wealth and health prosperity gospel, which kind of implicitly states that, you know, if you're experiencing blessings or privileges, that that means that 
God is pleased with you. But God is not concerned about outward appearances. He's concerned about what is going on in our hearts and what our disposition is towards him. Like I said about the definition of idolatry, it's deeper and it's more than just prioritizing who comes first in your life, God or whatever. It's also about loving and cherishing things that coincide with the nature and character of God. So what makes you confident that you're walking closely to God? What makes you confident? Is it your upbringing, your blessings, your health, your charity? What comforts you? This is a really good question. What comforts you when convictions and pangs of the conscience occur? When you have that feeling that when God is examining you, he's asking, where, where's your hope and where's your confidence in? So tonight, I'm hoping that you guys will allow God and you allow the Holy Spirit to really examine your hearts. And don't, don't chalk it up to be like, oh, you know, I'm okay, I'm okay, okay. I don't have any idolatry in my life. I don't, I don't have that issue because what you're doing right there is you're, you're having overconfidence in yourself. You're trying to muster up the sense of everything's okay. But there is an assurance. <clears throat> in the First Corinthians 10, 13, and this is kind of the pivot point of this passage, it's this assurance where we find that our confidence can't be in ourselves because we're sinful. We're prone to sinful desires, as Paul says he says here in uh, verse 6, Now these things took place as an example for us that we might not desire evil. That's the imperative, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters. And so how can we find our hope to run the race with endurance? How can we, how can we overcome sin? How can we come overcome temptations and trials that lure and try to pull us away from God? And the simple fact is that we put our confidence in God. It says here in verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Um, Alistair Begg points out five um, observations in this passage which really helped me um, to understand that everything, the source of our strength, the source of our confidence is God. He says that no temptation has overtaken you. The first point is that there is no temptation you'll face that is unique. It's all common to all of man. The second is that God is faithful to sanctify us. The third is that he puts a restraint on sin, that you won't be tempted beyond your ability. He also says that God will provide a way of escape, and that he will also provide spiritual support. Is there anything in that passage about us being the foundation for the strength? No, it's all God. It's all what he supplies for us, and so we have to put our faith and trust in him. And so, if it comes to, if you see a warning sign of, I have overconfidence in myself, it's pretty simple. Put your confidence in God. Okay, realize the foundation that you are, you, you can't stand. You're a three-legged chair, and if you lean on one side, you're going to fall over. But God is all four. I know that's a cheesy analogy, but <laughs> I think it kind of gets the point across. But the problem with looking at outward, ex- uh, outward experiences or appearances is the fact that we're missing the fact that idolatry stems or is fueled by sinful cravings. And that's point number two. Idolatry is fueled by sinful cravings or desires. And so I want to look at the the sins of the Israelites because it's easy to look at the outside and be like, oh, what was the main problem with the Israelites? Well, they grumbled, they complained, they were unthankful, they did sexual morality, they were worshiping a golden calf, they were testing God. But what was the deep-rooted problem? What What stemmed into that idolatry? What was it really going on there? Because the outward sins of the Israelites revealed inward sinful desires. And I think there's three things that kind of will really help us tackle. We've got to look at the target. We've got to look at the root problem, which is what we desire and what we crave. And so there's three. There's unfaithfulness, there's unbelief, and there's unthankfulness is what marked the Israelites. <clears throat> and so this unbelief kind of stemmed into unfaithfulness and eventually unthankfulness. If you remember, he recounts about the fiery serpents, uh, which is, if you guys ever take the chance to go and read that, it's a fantastic story, and it really captures the root problem of sin is that we don't believe in God, we don't believe in his goodness, his faithfulness, we don't trust in his character, and thus we don't have confidence in him. But the Israelites, you know, they, they were complaining, like, why did you bring us out of Egypt, you know, that we might die? It wasn't and when they asked the question, it wasn't a sense of humble dependence and true like inquiry, like a sense of, you know, God, why did you bring us out of Egypt? You know, what, what are you trying to do? No, it was a mocking. It was a, well, why did you bring us out of Egypt? So that we can die? Really? That's great. You, can't, you took us out here to kill us. It's a mocking of God's goodness. It's a sense that they don't believe 
that God is faithful and that they don't have any confidence in him. And so I, I bring this up because the root problem wasn't that they were grumbling and complaining. Yes, that was a symptom of the deeper issue that they didn't believe God and they were unfaithful to God and they were unthankful for what he did. And that stemmed from that unbelief, that sense that there was no confidence in God to, to bring them through this difficult time. And sometimes it's easy, you know, when we come to, like, application, when we come to how do we solve this problem, you know, and we, what kind of, well, I, I get you're talking about the heart, Nick, but, like, what do I just do? And it's like, well, remember, your actions stem from your heart. It stems from what you desire, what motivates you. An athlete is self-discipline and self-control, but there has to be a motivation to push them to do the run. There has to be an endurance. There has to, the, the only way you can have endurance is if you, you put, if you have a desire and a motivation. Um, so last semester, I started going to the gym a little bit, and I got to really get to understand the culture of gym life, which is completely different um, from the, anything I've experienced. But you ever notice those people who work out a lot, and they're ripped, super strong, strong, and they, you know, they, they can lift all this weight, and they look, you know, great, but you put them in a 5K race, and they will not make it more than 500 feet because they have no endurance. They're just building their appearance, their, their muscles, but they don't have any endurance. They can't run a race, put them in a 5K, and they, they won't last very long. And I think that's kind of what we need to look at is what is going to fuel us. Because if, if idolatry is fueled by sinful cravings, how do you think obedience is fueled? It's fueled by desire and cherishing of God, which is the opposite of what idolatry is, a cherishing of something or loving of something that is contrary to the nature of God. And so, let's look at those three sins again. Are you struggling with faithfulness? Are you struggling with belief in God? Are you struggling with thankfulness toward God? Well, belief in the goodness and faithfulness of God. Remember when they were bit by the fiery serpents, there was one solution. That was to look upon the bronze serpent that Moses put up on a stick. And it wasn't a look of like, you know, they're running around and then they, you know, they look and see it and they're like, oh, I'm healed. It was a look of belief, a sense that they had to look up and truly believe. And so when we look at Christ, do you truly believe? Do you truly see his worth and his value for who he is? And that will provide the motivation to not. And why, why do I say that? Because when it comes to faithfulness and endurance to running the race, it pertains to the character of God. Um, a lot of times when we talk about the command to refrain from sin, we're always focusing on what not to do, what not to do, what not to do. And it's, when we look at the Ten Commandments or the laws or like, whatever we're not supposed to do, you know, like don't commit sexual morality, you know, don't gossip, this or that. We focus so much on how we feel about that, but we don't recognize that it also is saying something about God, about God's character. A command to refrain from sin is in the same breath an invitation to embrace the goodness of God. Every temptation is not only an opportunity for evil, but an opportunity for good. It changes perspective when, you know, you talk about adultery, right? And we say, do not commit adultery in the Ten Commandments. It's also saying something about God's character. It's saying that God is faithful. Now, who, who doesn't like someone who's faithful? You know, if you're dating or you're married, don't you want your spouse to be faithful to you? Yes? No? Okay. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> of course. It, it, that's, that's what we desire. Like, that's why Jesus says, you know, do to other, unto others as you would want them to do to you. In the sense that, God, you don't commit adultery because you want, you appreciate God's faithfulness to you. And that's why you're not going to do it. But you see, the, the difference is this belief in the character. It's rooted in the goodness of God and the character of God. And from that stems thankfulness. From that stems thankfulness. <clears throat> and so the last, the last point I want to bring out, and then at the end I also want to just bring a, a word of assurance on what, how we can combat idolatry once and for all, but idolatry pushes the boundaries. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14 through 22, um, Paul starts out with saying, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. So if you remember, Chris preached um, last semester on chapter 8. I think it's important to remember that 8, 9, and 10, we have to put everything in context. And the book of Corinthians is kind of a response to concerns and questions that are occurring in the Corinth church. And so we first talked about how the meat sacrifice to idols sold in the marketplace and in the home, how Paul's addressing that in a sense of, is that sin, is that not sin? He's, he's saying, well, 
it's, it's really about the heart issue behind that. It's not necessarily sin. But if you wreak your brother, it, it's convinced it is. It's not like you're worshiping an idol or anything. You're just having food in a place. But don't be a stumbling block. Surrender your freedom. Surrender your rights for the benefit of your, your weaker brother or sister. Weaker brother or sister. And so Paul kind of seems to be continuing that discussion because it almost seems like the Corinthians are asking about meat sacrificed to idols sold in the marketplace. But now there's this topic. He ends, he, he builds up this, this whole uh, passage in chapter 10 to the fact of partaking in idol feasts. And this is where Paul kind of draws the line in the fact that, okay, that's one thing, but now you're wanting to partake in an idol feast at a prostitution temple. That's where the idol feasts were. They were at the prostitution temples in Corinth. He's like, I, you have freedom from the law. But that doesn't mean that you have freedom to do whatever you want. He's like, why are you asking about how, how close to get? He's like, flee from idolatry. Therefore, my beloved, it, it should be sensible. I'm, he's saying, I'm speaking as to sensible people with common sense. Flee from idolatry. And so I think we have to ask ourselves, do we ask how close we can get to sin? Paul brings up the Lord's Supper um, as, a, as a great illustration example. He says that the, the Lord's Supper is in a way a, a communion with God. It's a un, it represents the union with God that we've had, the fact that Christ died for our sins to save us. And so the object of that supper is the focus is on glorifying God. Well, these idol feasts, the object was a glorification of demons. As Paul says, he says, I don't believe an idol is anything. I'm not saying stay away from idol feasts because I believe an idol is real. No, I believe the devil, Satan, uses it to lure people away. It doesn't, Satan doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter if you, know, you believe in aliens or you're, you're a Wiccan. It, the whole point is that it's not that those idols are real. It's not that those spirits or gods are real. But the fact is that Satan's using it to lure you away. No matter what shape or form it looks like, it's different for everybody. He wants to lure you away. And if it's sexual morality, if it's pornography, if it's um, gossip, if it's an emotional dependency on somebody, it doesn't matter what it looks like. He wants to lure you away. And Paul's saying this feast is, is against what we believe in. We want, we're not going to be participants in that. If, we're, if the Lord's Supper means we're participating and we're participants in God's work of salvation and we're the recipients of it, and this idol feast, the object is these, is these demons or idols, why would you partake in it? We should not be asking how close we can get but rather how far we can run, hence flee from idolatry. Um, a very awkward example that I can use, um, and yes, I hope it does make you feel uncomfortable because it is supposed to, is the fact that it's kind of like if you claim to love your spouse a lot, and you're like, I love them, they're great, I just want to be around them all the time, they're fantastic, and then you go, because this is kind of maybe what the, the Corinthians are potentially doing with Paul, and you go to your pastor and you say, now, there's this girl at work, or there's this guy at work, and I'm, you know, how, how far is too far with adultery? Like, if I go out to coffee with them, is that too far? Um, or what if, you know, I send them a text, is that too far? And it's like, why are you even asking the question in the first place? And we do it so much. I mean, I, I know I, I hear it a lot, and I know I struggle with that at times about thinking to myself, well, how far is too far with this? You know, like, is this is this not Christian? And so I want a list of to-dos and don'ts. I want a list of feeling secure and what I want to do. Maybe I put that overconfidence in myself so that way I don't have to deal with my conscience when I go and sin. And so we ask ourselves, how, how close can I get? You know, maybe with drinking. Maybe, well, how far is too far with my girlfriend or boyfriend? Or how far, how, what is gossip? Like, what is, you know, is it okay if we talk about this person if we're talking about how we can help them, you know, or... It's okay if it's with five, is it, with, is it five or six? And we get legalistic and we tend to want things as, as neat as possible. We're asking not about where our heart stands or why we're wanting to do or get close to it, but just we want a list of do's and don'ts. <clears throat> Christian freedom from the law does not free us to do what we want, but rather it frees us to do what is right out of a true and genuine desire and yearning to be like Christ. Are you testing the boundaries of your Christian freedom? Are you trying to create moral 
gray areas where there is none. I think this is the question that is, is pertinent. I know some of you guys are kind of like, uh, I don't really want to look at that right now. And that's the temptation, is when we see, well, maybe I'm marked by overconfidence in myself or a sinful desire like unbelief, unfaithfulness. Maybe you're hardened or cynical towards others or towards life in general. Or maybe you're trying to test the boundaries and you're recognizing, wow, my whole disposition, my whole heart this time has been kind of wanting to see how far I can take things with my sin. But it, it strikes the heart of the matter is where, what do you cherish or what is your idol? What do you put up front in front of you? And this is, this is very important. I really want you guys to, to really hear me out right here and right now because, you know, every time I, you guys ever send a sermon and you guys get convicted? Yes, no, nobody, wow. I, maybe we have overconfidence issue. <laughs> I do a lot, just like, you know, the last Sunday and the Sunday before then, the Sunday before that. I sometimes feel God, his, his, his burning eyes of like justice is just burning through me and I'm just like, oh my goodness, he sees me for who I am. He knows the struggles that I have, and he's going to address it. And you know what the first tendency is to do? Is become confident in myself. Well, well, I mean, like, I, I did preach that really great sermon uh, last semester, you know, and, and people patted me on the back, and it was good. I mean, so maybe I'm fine. Or I'll, I'll listen to my parents who said, oh, you're, you're, doing a, you're doing a great job. You're a godly man. And I'll put my confidence in these outward things while rejecting to look at what's inside of me. But here's the thing, the very same God who has wrath and justice and is disciplinary towards children is also the same God who can save you from it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. The, the, that's, what the, that's what the enemy wants, you see, is once you have to let the Holy Spirit examine your heart and there's that fear that you're doing something that's not right, instead of allowing the physician, the great physician, and your father to come to discipline you and to look into you, we have the tendency to run to run away. But then we're running away from the very salvation that will deliver us from those temptations and trials. I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant trick that the devil likes to play. So my question to you is, do you believe in the goodness of God? Do you believe in the faithfulness of God that he can save you? No temptation has overtaken you. Do you truly believe in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, or are you, are you unwilling to look at it? It's not an easy word. It's hard to sometimes allow God to look into us because we're afraid of what we might find. But there's only one way to run the race before us with endurance, and that's with a desire and a belief that God is faithful to save us from our sins. And that's the gospel. If you believe that Christ has died for your sins through the crucifixion and the resurrection, that he himself took on the wrath of God and imputed his righteousness to us, don't you think that he'll help you through this? Or is your sin too great? I highly doubt it. So, that's just something I want to leave with you guys tonight as we look in this passage of 1 Corinthians 10. Please believe and put your confidence in God. Be stirred by a desire to know him more, his character, his faithfulness to you. And that will be the endurance you can to run the race, to be self-disciplined and to have self-control. But we have to allow ourselves to, to let ourselves be examined by God as hard as it is. But it's no big deal if he's the great physician. I'd rather be under the scalpel of a physician than um, somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing, right? But God is the great physician. He knows what he's doing. He's also a father who loves his son <clears throat> or his daughter. And so, and so I ask and I, I pray that you guys would believe and have assurance in Christ, not in yourselves, but in Christ and Christ alone. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, I thank you for your word, um, your word of warning as well as your word of assurance that we can come to you in faith and believing that you are good and faithful to save us from our sins. 
Uh, it's a continual journey, Lord, a race that doesn't stop when we first come to know you, but it is continual, a sanctification, Lord, that we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling, that you would be glorified and that we would be satisfied in you, that we would come to know you more and more. Help us to remember the prize at the end of the race, which is your son, Jesus Christ.